We are all here tonight, walillahi alhamd, because we claim that la ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. Is that what we believe? We claim that la ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah is what we believe. And nevertheless, for a lot of people, this is a belief that has dropped its luggage and sat on the ton and did not move on to penetrate the greatest morsel of your body, the heart. A police officer in a Muslim country writes to a sheikh describing the events that led him to his return to the Almighty Lord. He mentions seeing Accidents and crash victims was a normal part of my day. However, one incident was different. My partner and I, he said, was parked on the shoulder of the highway, chatting. Everything calm, peaceful, quiet. When suddenly the scene shattered to the hideous sound of metal bodies becoming one. We threw our heads behind, he said. A head-on collision. The result of a vehicle slipping into the lane of the oncoming traffic. You could not describe the carnage. Two young men sprawled in the first car. We gently removed them to the side of the road and quickly went back to the second car to assist the driver. However, he was dead. So we ran back to the two young men laying side by side on the pavement. My partner began saying to them, Say la ilaha illallah, seeing them in that crucial, critical condition on the verge, on the brink of death, say, La ilaha illallah. Fa inna allaha harrama ala nari man qala la ilaha illallah yabataghi bithalika wajha Allah. For indeed the Almighty Lord has forbidden for hellfire anyone that testifies la ilaha illallah seeking thereby nothing except the countenance, the face, the pleasure of the Almighty Lord. These two young men, were they able to utter this testification of faith, this golden word, this word of salvation, of successfulness, the key to paradise? Were they able to utter this? No. Instead, they uttered. They began humming the hypnotic lyrics of some satanic song. Instead, they started singing some evil satanic song. The officer said, I have never seen anyone die in such, or dying in such a satanic way. I was terrified. However, my partner, he mentions, repeated the instructions, say la ilaha illallah, he did not give up. Wallahi, if these two young men said la ilaha illallah throughout their life, 
with the application of La ilaha illallah, it would, be, it would have been easy for them to say La ilaha illallah. But when there's no prayer, no fasting, no pilgrimage, no La ilaha illallah in reality in their life, how are they going to say La ilaha illallah when they're on the brink of death? You can never ever succeed. So he repeated the instructions, say La ilaha illallah, but to no avail. The hum became a slow silence. The first one dropped, then the second one dropped, both did. The last thing they uttered, the last thing they whispered, the last breath they breathed was the breath of Satan. The police officer and his partner in a state of silence, could not believe it, carried the corpse to the nearest hospital. No, brothers and sisters, any person, every person who is used to committing sin, thus not repenting from that evil sin, Satan will seize his heart. He will overpower his heart. And it, the sin, will be the only thing that he remembers even in the last seconds, the last moments of his life. So when his family, his relatives, when his friends come to induce him with the testification of faith, so it can be the last word before he dies, the sin will overpower him and he will say nothing except that which he is to commit of sin in the life of this world. You know, Satan, at the moment of death, this is his final chance to destroy man. He would throw everything at you, O servant, no matter how strong you are. He would try to destroy you, especially the last seconds of your life. He will come like a tank with full ammunition in order to drive you back on that ilaha illallah. And the only way that you can ever fight and defeat this evil, accursed, is by you implementing la ilaha illallah while you are still alive. No other time. You cannot implement it before your death. Now is the time. There was an auctioneer who used to work in the marketplace. A true story. Every time he would go home, as soon as he entered the home, it was a merchant. He would have his dinner, barely speak to anyone, straight in his room, 30, 40, 50. The next day, straight in the morning, no prayer, no nothing, straight to his merchandise, his trade, that's his life. He'll come home in the afternoon, he has his dinner, into his room, does not spend time with his family, does not spend time at all utilizing his life in an Islamic way, 30, 40, 50. Every single night, 30, 40, 50. He's in love with money. Death came to him naturally. He's going to die. He cannot live forever. That 30, 40, 50 is going to end one day. So death came to him. And his sons were righteous. They said, Ya Abi, Ya Waladi, Ya Waladi. Say la ilaha illallah. Say la ilaha illallah. What did he say? 30, 40, 50. <laughs> it's an authentic narration. It happened in Saudi Arabia. Instead of saying la ilaha illallah, he did utter. He uttered 30, 40, 50. And thus he died. On 30, 40, 50. What a sad end. What an evil end. What a satanic ending. A person might even die while committing sin. And thus he will meet his creator. He will meet his owner. He will meet the one that created him on the day of resurrection. The way he died. As the hadith collected by Al-Hakim. Rahimahullah ta'ala. That our beloved Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 
Whoever dies on something, he will meet Allah in the same state that he died on. Brothers and sisters, this hadith is authentic. Can you imagine a person dying while committing polytheism or kufr or killing someone? Or while committing adultery or fornication and then you die in that state? And then you get resurrected while committing this evil abomination? Can you think of a person dying while you're not praying? Can you think of a person dying in the month of Ramadan and is not fasting? Can you think of a person dying and he did not perform pilgrimage even though his money has reached the mountain level? Can you believe a person dying while he's drinking alcohol and he dies? Or he's stealing and he dies? Or he's gambling and he dies? Or he's taking drugs and he dies? Or marijuana and he dies? And he'll be resurrected while smoking that marijuana or putting the idol inside him? Because you will die the way that you, you'll be resurrected the way that you died. Can you believe a person being resurrected when he died being a cuckold? A person who's unfaithful to his wife, meaning he allows her to be flirtatious around men, does not care less about his wife, where she goes, how she goes, how she comes, how she's dressed. How can a person even think? To be a cuckold. Can you die a Muslim? A Muslim male? While you're wearing gold on your hands, on your neck, on your ear, or shaving, or taking riba? How will you be resurrected, dear brothers and sisters? Is the way you die. Is the way you die. One of Satan's tricks is procrastination by which he induces the people to delay their repentance. That's why the early scholars would always warn against the saying, I will. They said, I warn you to say, I will. That is, do not say, I will repent. I will do this. I will do that tomorrow. Why tomorrow? Are you going to live tomorrow? Are we living today? Why say tomorrow? Where are you today? Oh, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. And what makes you, O oh slave of Allah, think that you will ever live tomorrow? This predecessor, predecessor mentioned as well, the similitude of a firm believer in how he returns in repentance to Allah Ta'ala from every sin at any time, Fearing a bad end, fearing Allah Ta'ala, to the one who is careless in delaying his sin, is the similitude of a group of people on a journey. They enter the village. That's the firm believer straight away. He immediately goes and buys that which he needs to continue his journey. While the careless one relaxes tomorrow, inshallah, I'll buy it tomorrow. I'll buy my things tomorrow so I can continue. There's a lot of time. Then suddenly, the leader of the journey says, we are going to depart now. The firm believer is ready. He's bought his stuff. Let's go. Let us go right now. I'm ready. The careless one, please, one more day. Please, another hour. Please, please, please what? What's this please? Where have you been all this time? This similitude is likewise for the people of this world. The firm believer, when the angel of death comes suddenly and strikes you, he says, Alhamdulillah, I've been waiting for you all my life. Where have you been? I'm ready to go. His luggage is already locked. His luggage of righteousness, his good deeds, is packed up, it's sealed, it's ready to go, depart. He cannot wait to meet his Lord. As for the careless one, Ya Rabb, please return me back to this earth that I may do 
a good deed in order to please you. That I may do a good deed. He, maybe. Give me another chance. SubhanAllah. What other chance do you want? You got a chance right now. You are living. Why are you not now filling out that luggage with righteousness, with worship, with acts of obedience? Why do you want another chance after you die? You want to enjoy your life as a lot of Muslims say, Ah, you're too young to go to Hajj. Enjoy it. Buy a house of riba. Buy a car of riba. Get married, get kids. When you get old, white beard if they allow that. White hair, hair loss. Now go to Hajj. Your life is finished. Your life is finished. This is procrastination. We are travelers and no other, as Abdullah ibn Umar mentions, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took him by the shoulders. He grabbed his shoulders and said, Live in this world, ya Umar, ya ibn Umar, as a wayfarer, as a stranger, as a traveler. For one day you are going to leave this country. You're going to leave this earth. You are going to leave to your final destination, which is no other than paradise or hell. And he used to say, Ibn Umar, always on his tongue, if you live till night, do not expect to live till morning. And if you see the morning, do not expect to see the night. Take advantage from your health for the times that you are afflicted by disease and you are unable to do optional duties and take advantage of your life, for your, for your, of your death for your life, or of your life for your death. In other words, that we must right now, with, the, with our best of ability, work hard, pull our socks up, prepare ourselves for our destination. We are all travelers. Let us be travelers to the Almighty Lord. What Allah wants, let us prepare that before we get there. Let us prepare that lunchbox. Let us prepare that lunchbox. And the lunchbox is righteousness. Muhammad ibn Abi Imran, a pious predecessor heard his Shaykh, Shaykh Hatim al asam one of the great early pious predecessors, being asked how he reached the level of reliance upon Allah Ta'ala. He said, easy. I became convinced in four things. And these four things, listen to them very carefully. These four things penetrated my heart. Thus, I acted upon that which was in my heart. He said, one, I became convinced that no one will ever touch that, the provision that Allah Ta'ala has ordained for me. Thus I am content. How beautiful is that? If we understand the meaning of this, but not many have understood it. Meaning, whatever Allah gives you, how much He gives you, you know that Allah has given you that and that is all He's given you. You don't care what this person has got, how much he's got, why he's got it. It doesn't bother us. What you care about is what Allah has given you. And you say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah ala hadhihi ni'mah. All praises to Allah Ta'ala for the blessing He has bestowed upon me. Not trying to seek to be better than His bounty, His blessing, His provision. He does not bother you. What bothers you is... To say Alhamdulillah to that which Allah has given you, no matter how much He's given you, feel content because this is what Allah has given you and you should be happy and not discontent and want others and other things. Second, He said, I am convinced that no one on earth will do good deeds except me, so I am busy doing it myself. In other words, He believed that. He was the only one obliged, that's how we should all believe, to do good deeds, righteous deeds, and if you do not do it, you're destroyed. So he is busy in himself all the time doing that which the Almighty Lord loves. Number three, he mentions, I am certain that death will come unexpectedly. Thus I am busy in myself in expectation of it. How beautiful is this? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, death is going to come to us. It's not going to come to us by an invitation saying, two weeks' time, your death is due. 
So get prepared for it. Make sure your luggage is correct. Make sure you wear the correct clothes. Make sure the perfume is correct. Make sure your deeds are correct. No. There's no such thing as this. Death will come to you and it will hit you hard without you even knowing. So prepare for it. As this great man, Shaykh Hatim al Ahsan did. Number four, I am certain that I can never ever escape the sight of Allah Ta'ala. So I am ashamed. I feel ashamed, embarrassed. I am shy to disobey Allah Ta'ala while He is watching me. How beautiful is this? How beautiful is this? Do we think of that, Ya Ahmad? Subhanallah. Do we think before we approach any, confront any action, Allah is watching us? I better not do it if He does not like it. No, we don't care less. A lady walks in the street, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Oh, you are allowed to look at the ladies. They are blessing from Allah Ta'ala. Look at the beauty of Allah, they say. Where's the vision of Allah, which is always following you? And if you had the chance, you'd probably devour her. Where is the vision of Allah? You go to the bank. No one watching me. No one watching me. You go to the bank. No one's watching me, you say. Oh, Muhammad is not here today. Ahmad's not here. My cousin's not here. This person, the sheikh's not here. There's no one but me and that lady that's going to do my contract, my riba contract. It's all right. Allahu Akbar. Who cares about Ahmad, Muhammad, or your balot? What about the Almighty Lord? The one that is going to judge you. Ahmad's not going to judge you. Muhammad's not going to judge you. But the Almighty Lord will judge you. The vision of the Almighty Lord will never ever leave you. Yahya ibn Mu'ad, another great predecessor, mentioned the most naive things in my sight is to linger in sin, feeling no regret, while hoping for a far off pardon. You know, people commit sin. They linger strongly, severely in sin. Yet there's no remorse. They don't care. They think, all right, not a problem. It's become easy for them. It's light. It's a norm for them. Yet at the same time, they want Allah to forgive them. Allahu ghafoorun rahim, they say. Allah is the all forgiver. Don't be extreme. Don't be hard. Commit sin. Allah will forgive you. But they never remember and he is the most uh, severe in punishment. Now, Allahu Ghafoor Al Rahim. If Ali Walad, do what you want. Allah is all forgiving, they say. The most naive things in my eyes is to hope to get close to Allah Ta'ala, as this great man mentioned, without doing any good deeds awaiting for the harvest of paradise with the seeds of hellfire. Contrary, contradiction, it can never happen. Another great scholar of the past, Ibrahim ibn Adham, a great sheikh of the third century. He was the great teacher and companion of the great Tabi'i, the companion's companion by the name of Sufyan al-Thawri. He was asked regarding the verse of the Almighty Lord, in Surah Ghafir, verse number 60, translated, And call unto me, and I will answer your prayers. Allah is saying, And call unto me, and I will answer your prayers. They said, Ya yes, Shaykh Ibrahim, we call unto Allah Ta'ala, but our prayers are not answered. What's our problem? As one person came to me from the Kemba Mosque, had a list like this. This has been my dua for the last five years. I go, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, you write it down. He goes, yes, because I have to say it every night. But I guess I'm not getting anything out of it. Let us see what Ibrahim said to him. Sheikh Ibrahim said to these people of the first century. When they asked him, Ya yeah, Ibrahim, they questioned him. Yeah, our Lord says, call unto me and I will answer your prayers. Why is our prayers not answered, they said. He said, one, our Muslims, you know Allah Ta'ala, Yet, you do not obey him. Two, 
You recite the Quran, yet you do not act in according to it. You know how many people read the Quran? They kiss the Quran, they place it on the shelf, and then they go and take riba. Then they go commit fornication, they don't pray, they don't perform fasting or pilgrimage. Is the Quran by kissing it and putting it on the shelf? And then they raise their hands out, Ya Rab, give me, give, give you what? Look at your status. You recite the Quran and you do not act in according to it. What is he gonna, what is he gonna give you? Are you a Muslim? Is he gonna help you in the way you are? Are you helping yourself? Number three, he said, You know Shaitan, the accursed, evil, satanic one, yet you have agreed with him. You have allowed him to whisper to you, thus executing that which he whispers to you. Number four, you proclaim your love for the beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet you abandon his sunnah. How many times do we see brothers, unfortunately, when you say to him, call Allah, or call the Rasul, Wallah al-Shafi'i says this, Imam Ahmad says this, Abu Hanifa says this, Malik says this, Shaykh Fulan says this, Ahmad Rifai says this, Arqul says this. But subhanAllah, where's al Rasul who said this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You proclaim, number five, your love for paradise, yet you do not any, do anything to gain it. You proclaim your fear for hellfire, yet you do the acts of hellfire. You say, indeed, death is reality, yet you are sitting and living as though you're going to live forever. No preparation. You engage in finding the faults of the human beings when yourself are the worst of people. Not even looking at your own faults. You eat the provisions of Allah Ta'ala, yet you do not thank Him. And thanking Him is not saying Alhamdulillah and thus, that's it, no. Thanking Him, brothers, is showing gratitude by acts of worship. This is the thanking that you should thank Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala with. It's a literal thanking, practical with your acts, with your hands, with your body. Not just to say Alhamdulillah. You bury the dead, he mentions, but you do not take heed. You do not take a lesson from it. You know, why do we, as Muslims, why are we advised to go to the graveyards? Why are we advised to carry the dead? Why are we advised always, at all times, to think, to talk, to remind each other of death, that we, in return, know that we are all of us on the verge, on the brink of death. It could be any second, not any day, any second. This is the reason that we are advised highly always to speak about death. But we don't take heed of it. We speak about death here, and then when we leave, we forget. Enter our lifestyle, forgetting everything the teacher has said. Or what you have seen in the graveyard, when you carry the dead and so forth. We return to the story of the police officer, we haven't finished it yet. He mentions that he was drifting away from Allah Ta'ala. He narrates that what an odd world he says. After six months after the first accident, a strange accident happened that sealed his prophet, that sealed his return to Allah Ta'ala. He said, Everything was quiet. A young man was driving. But within one of the tunnels leading to the city, he was maimed by a flat tire. To the side of the road, he parked the car, stepped out, went to the back, removed the spare tire. Suddenly, the whistle, the horn, of a flying, speeding car from behind, and in less than a second, bam! It collided with the crippled car. He said, the young man in between the two cars fell to the ground with critical injuries. 
We rushed to the scene, grabbed the young boy, me and my partner, he said, took him to the car, called the, amb called the ambulance, called the hospital to prepare for our arrival. The ambulance was going to be late, so they put him in the car. He mentions the police officer that he was of blossom age, tender age. He was a young adult, still in his late teens. He was mumbling something, but we could not understand what he was mumbling due to the rush that we were in. He said he was religious. You could tell from his appearance. Then the police officer said, when we placed him in the back of the car, we could make out what he was mumbling. He said, through all that pain, through all that suffering, we could see him suffering, this young man. His heart was reciting the verses of the Almighty Lord. He said he was so immersed in the recitation that, subhanAllah, you could not even tell that this young man was suffering. You could not even tell that this young man was suffering. The police officer said his clothes were soaked in blood. His bones were clearly snapped in many places. However, he continued with his unique, tender, soft voice reciting the verses of the glorious Qur'an. Suddenly, the officer said, as we were listening intently, me and my partner, a shiver climbed up my spine. The hair on my arms and my legs stood up. I watched very carefully at the young man as we were driving to the hospital. His hymn became silent. He raised his hand, raised his index towards the sky, and said, La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. He said, La ilaha illallah. Thus he slumped. Thus he slumped. He said, Quickly, I went to the back of the seat. I felt his breathing, I felt his pulse, I felt his heart. He was dead. He was dead. He could said, I could not stop staring at his face, the beauty of his face. A tear fell from my eyes, but I hid it in shame. I turned to my partner and told him that the boy's life has ceased. He's finished. That young man is finished. The police officer burst in cries. And thus when he heard his partner crying in such a manner, he could not hold himself. The whole car, the patrol car, was fogged with emotions. Was fogged with emotions as they were driving to the hospital. They reached. They struggled through the corridors, telling the nurses, the doctors, the onlookers what had happened. One of the hospital staff went and called his home. His brother picked up the phone and said, after being informed of his brother's accident, he said, my brother would go and visit his only grandmother every single week who lived outside the town. And he would make sure that he would always spend time with those poor children and orphans who were idling in the streets. The whole town knew him, he said. They knew him because he used to give them Islamic literature, cassettes, books. He filled his old Mazda, his dusty old Mazda, with sugar and wheat and rice and even candies for the poor people in that town. Yet he himself was struggling to live. He himself was struggling to live. Yet he preferred those orphans, those poor children, those poor families over his life. Thus, his last words was very easy. 
It wasn't hard for him to utter, La ilaha illallah. Why, brothers and sisters? Because he lived La ilaha illallah. He knew the meaning of La ilaha illallah. He applied it from day one, La ilaha illallah, until the last second of his life. Satan had no chance. Satan had no chance on him. He tried. And wallahi, he would try to the most strongest believer. But know that the almighty Lord safeguards and preserves the soldiers of his. And indeed, that young man, rahmatullah alayhi, true story, was a soldier of Allah Ta'ala. Imagine dying on that way. Imagine dying on the battlefield, raising the flag of the ilaha illallah. As Allah says clearly, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَكُونَ فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَكُوا بِهِمْ مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ أَلَّا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ الله أكبر أَلَّا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Do not think of those who are killed in the path of Allah Ta'ala as dead. Do not think of those who are killed in the path of Allah Ta'ala as dead. They are alive with Allah Ta'ala, with provisions. They rejoice of that which Allah has bestowed upon them of His bounty. Rejoicing for those brothers who have not come yet. Saying, fear not, O brothers, fear not, nor grieve. Allahu Akbar. They're up there saying, O people on the battlefield, O Muslims, fear not and do not grieve. For indeed we have received what the Almighty Lord has promised us. Imagine this right now happening. Wallahi, it's happening now. Those who are in birds, green birds, their souls in green birds flying. Saying, fear not, O Muslims, on the battlefield. Fear not, nor grieve. For you are on the path of truth. The Almighty Lord has given us that which he has promised. We are waiting for you to rejoice with us. Imagine dying on that path, or is it better to die on the path of humming some hypnotic evil lyric of some song? Or saying ya habib to ya habibi when you die, as the majority of those evil Arabic songs mention. Isn't it nice to die while performing hajj when the man fell off his camel? His she camel. He fell dead. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this man will be resurrected, will be raised from his grave in a state of talbiyah. In a state of talbiyah. Imagine that. You come out of the grave. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda. Wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. Ya Rabb, laka wal mulk. La sharika lak. Imagine that. Imagine that. Allahu Akbar. Imagine being raised while dying in Hajj and saying, Oh Allah, I have responded to your call. Here I am. Allahu Akbar. Was it better dying while cheating the person in his scales or doing a robbery or backbiting or slandering or cursing? Is it better to die in that? Or better than die in the state of talbiyah. Brothers and sisters, we have a chance. We are still living. This is the only chance that you ever have. Do not lose it. There is no tomorrow for you. There is no tomorrow. It is only today. For indeed the world is proving this. Thus, let us pick up our socks, inshallah ta'ala, and prepare ourselves for our final destination, the destination, insha'Allah ta'ala, of paradise and no other. Akulu ma tasma'oon wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.